This video concerns God's cups in the Holy Scriptures, which is critical information, especially for Christians. Everyone is drinking a spiritual cup from God, whether they realize it or not. God has given us great instructions and dire warnings about these cups. I have searched the entire Bible and found every instance where the Holy Scriptures speak about these cups. This video will show you exactly how it works. At the end of this video, you will have a much better understanding about God's cups. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke often concerning cups in the New Testament. The Old Testament of the Bible also contains a lot of information concerning these cups. However, these cups are a metaphor of much more important things. Do you have any idea what these might be? Tell me in the comments section below. I'd love to hear what you think. Most Christian churches regularly perform a ritual focusing around a special cup, as the Lord Jesus commanded them to do. Many of them are completely unaware of what he actually intended. Jesus Christ based his gospel message upon a cup. The book of Revelation gives us dire warnings about a cup. We need to know about these cups, how to find the right one, and how to avoid the wrong one. So let's get started looking at the scriptures. The first thing we're going to look at is when the Bible uses the cup as a metaphor of an individual man's life. Okay, the first verse we're going to take a look at is in Psalms chapter 16. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance, and of my cup you maintain my lot. There are actually two cups here. See, their sorrow shall be multiplied, those that hasten after another god. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer. Drink offerings of blood. So that's a cup of blood. I will not offer, nor take up their names into my lips, the names of other gods. The Lord is a portion of my inheritance and of my cup. So you have here you have David's cup. And then you have the cup to other gods. Drink offerings full of blood. Now what caught my eye with this drink offerings of blood. Is what Jesus said at the Last Supper. He said to his disciples he said. Take this cup and drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which is given for you and for all men. So, that's the cup of blood. But this cup of blood is, is to idols, to demons, to false gods. Next one is in Psalm chapter 23. This is a pretty well-known psalm. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. In verse 5, he says, my cup runneth over. So that's talking about his life and his spiritual experience with God. His cup running over is... He has more than enough. It's, it's overflowing. Now the last verse regarding the personal metaphor is in Psalm 116. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Return unto your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with thee. For you have delivered my soul from death, 
my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, All men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Okay, in this song, in this song, which is also probably written by David, um, he says in verse 10, I believed, therefore I have spoken. So what did he say? I, back in verse 4, I called upon the name of the Lord, Yahweh. O oh Lord, I beseech you, deliver my soul. God, please help me. So I believed, therefore I have spoken. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. So to call upon the name of the Lord, O oh God, help me, is to take the cup of salvation. God will give you the cup of salvation. So now we're finished with the personal cup scriptures. That's it. There's only a few. But now there's a lot on the cup of God's wrath. Now that's something we're going to have to figure out as we read the scriptures about it. And it gets explained pretty well, I think. And uh, so now we're going to do a, a little series of scriptures from the Old Testament about the cup of God's wrath. And then, because that that cup is uh, appears in the book of Revelation, so we're going to learn a lot more about it. And after we finish the God's wrath cup, and then we'll move into the New Testament and look at all the things Jesus and the apostles said about cups, and then we'll look at the Revelation. So stay tuned. So there are a few uh, psalms that talk about the cup of God's wrath. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone. Sort of like language of Sodom and Gomorrah. And a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. So here's the personal cup again. The, the cup of the wicked is snares and fire and brimstone and a horrible storm. For the righteous Lord loves righteousness. His countenance does behold the upright. The next psalm that talks about the cup is Psalm 75. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he pours out of the same. So he has a cup in his hand full of red wine mixed with something, and he pours out from the cup. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. Now that he said this, this language reminds me of the Proverbs. Okay, Proverbs 23, 31. Look not on the wine when it is red, when it gives its color in the cup, when it moves itself aright. Don't stare at that wine in the cup. At the last it bites like a serpent and it stings like, a, like an adder, a snake. Your eyes shall behold strange women, and your heart shall utter perverse things. Yeah, you shall be as he that lies down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lies upon the top of a mast. Well, and laying on the top of a mast of a ship. They have stricken me, you will say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I didn't feel it. When will I awake? 
I will seek it yet again. You're addicted. It's talking about alcoholism. Okay, Isaiah 51. And I have put my words in your mouth, and I have covered you in the shadow of my hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, You are my people. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury, that you have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. Therefore hear this, you afflicted, and drunk, but not with wine. Thus says the Lord, the Lord, and your God that pleads the cause of his people, Behold, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no more drink it again, but I will put it into the hand of them which afflict you, which have said to your soul, Bow down that we may go over. And you have laid your body as the ground, and as the street to them that went over. That's the first view of this cup of fury, that Jerusalem is the first one to drink it. So now we're in the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was a prophet leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC by Babylon. Neither shall men tear themselves for them in mourning to comfort them for the dead. Neither shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or for their mother. So no more happy-go-lucky stuff. And it shall come to pass, when you shall show this people all these words, that they shall say to you, why, why has the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? And what is our iniquity? What is our sin? What is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? So they, they call God God. This is our God. But we haven't sinned against him. What are you talking about? Then you shall say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, says the Lord, and have walked after other gods, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. And you have done worse than your fathers, for behold, you walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not listen to me. So everyone's doing his own thing. So that's as far as we need to read for this. But you get the idea. Of, that was the cup of consolation mentioned. The cup of consolation um, comes out when everything's going to be healed. The healing coming. But the cup of consolation is being withheld. The cup of wrath is coming. Jeremiah 25, verse 15. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad, because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink to whom the Lord had sent me, to wit, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof, to make them a desolation, an astonishment, a hissing and a curse, as it is this day. Pharaoh, king of Egypt and his servants and the princes and all the people, Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon, and all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are on the face of the earth. And the king of Shishak shall drink after them. So all the nations of the world will drink this cup of wrath, and at the end, the king of Shishak will drink it. And who's the king of Shishak? We'll take a look at that as soon as we finish this, this reading right here. We're going to go up to 38, verse 38. Therefore you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink and be drunken, and spew and fall and rise no more. 
because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be if they refuse to take the cup at your hand to drink, then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, You shall surely drink. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name, and should you be utterly unpunished, you shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore prophesy against them all these words, and say to them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter, utter his voice from his holy habitation, he shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. And that's the great wine press at the end of the book of Revelation. It's the second coming of Christ. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh, he will give them that are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation. A great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Howl, you shepherds. So who are the shepherds? The shepherds are like the priests. The, the leaders, the, the leaders of the people are the shepherds. The people are the sheep. Howl, you shepherds, and cry, and wallow yourselves in the ashes, you principal of the flock, for the days of your slaughter and of your dispersions are accomplished, and you shall fall like a pleasant vessel. And the shepherds shall have no way to flee, nor the principle of the flock to escape. A voice of the cry of the shepherds, and a howling of the principle of the flock shall be heard, for the Lord has spoiled their pasture. No more uh, shearing of the sheep for the shepherds. And the peaceable habitations are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He has forsaken his covert as the lion, for their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. So God is angry. He allows the oppressor to come in. There's only two places in the whole Bible, both in the book of Jeremiah, where the name Shishak appears. The one is the place where we just read it, where he drinks the cup of fury at the end after all the nations of the earth have drunk in it now the next verse on shishak is jeremiah fifty-one forty-one. and yes i got a haircut okay how is shishak taken and how is the praise of the whole earth surprised so this is another parallel where shishak is the, the verse is calling Shishak the praise of the whole earth. How is Shishak taken? And the parallel, how is the praise of the earth, the whole earth surprised? And then another parallel, how is Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? So this word astonishment is from the Hebrew word shama, which means a, a waste, an appalling thing. Okay, how has Babylon become so appalling? And the praise of the whole earth has become so appalling. So this is something that the whole earth sees as something good. And all of a sudden it becomes appalling. And Shishak is the, the leader of Babylon. Now what, what does the name Shishak mean? Another name for Babylon, ap apparently taken from the goddess Shak. The goddess Shak is thy, mean, Shishak means your fine linen. Fine linen. 
So this uh, king that is the praise of the whole earth is known for fine linen. Interesting, huh? The sea, the sea is come up upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of the waves. Now, now see, this is probably because the, the, the cup of wrath goes out to the whole earth and Shishak is the last one to drink of it. And Shishak is the praise of the whole earth who becomes an astonishment when she, when this Shishak drinks from this cup. Um, this is like Babylon the Great in the book of Revelation, which we will take a look at. Um, and this is like the, the great, uh, the woman, the, it's a great church. And it, it, God saying, get out of her, my people. So this is uh, probably talking about Babylon the Great. Because it's talking about after the drink, drinking the cup after the whole earth is drank. Okay. Her cities are a desolation, a dry land and a wilderness. A land where no man dwells, neither does any son of man pass. And okay, so now it goes on talking more about um, the, the destruction of ancient Babylon. I will punish Bel in Babylon and I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he swallowed up and the nations shall not flow together any more unto him. Yea, the, the wall of Babylon shall fall. And then you can see here the next verse. My people go out of her and deliver you every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. The, this is uh, the same same message in the book of Revelation. Get out of her, my people. And as you know, Babylon today is just a it's just a, a, a hill of sand, really. It's it's a heap. Saddam Hussein. Uh, was rebuilding the city as a tourist attraction, uh, but the this the main part of the city I think he rebuilt, but the city was actually much much larger than that. The city walls go for miles, and that part is just a, a wilderness still. I don't know what's happened to it since Saddam Hussein died. I imagine it's still about the same, just uh, I don't know if they've continued building on it or if it's just pretty much rebuilt. So now we're going to take a, a little bit deeper look here at the fall of Babylon because Babylon is the, has, has been, is, is the last one to drink of this cup and is very much linked with this this last ruler on earth okay so we're going to look at um, Jeremiah chapter 51 starting in verse 1 just to get a look at the fall of Babylon with the golden cup thus says the Lord behold I will raise up against Babylon and, and them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me, a destroying wind. So it's Babylon and anyone dwelling within Babylon. Babylon is identified as those that rise up against God. And I will send to Babylon fanners that shall fan her and shall empty her land. For in the day of trouble, they shall be against her all around. Against him that bends, let the archer bend his bow. And against him that lifts up, lift himself up in his brigandine, and spare ye not her young men. Destroy you utterly all her ho host. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and they that are thrust through in her streets. For Israel has not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, the Lord of hosts, 
Though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel, flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Babylon has been a, co a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. So here's the, the cup of God's wrath. And Babylon is the one holding the golden cup, making all the nations drink of her wine and making the nations mad like crazy. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl for her, take balm for her pain, if so she may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. You see, Babylon had a chance to be healed, but she didn't become healed. She just kept going with her same old tricks, right? She is not healed. Forsake her and let us go, everyone to his own country. For her judgment reaches to heaven and is lifted even to the skies. That's very much the language in the book of Revelation. The Lord has brought forth our righteousness. Come and let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord God. So this is, uh, we are declaring the work of the Lord, but Babylon is declaring something very different. Make bright arrows, gather the shields, the Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. This is like southern Iran. For his device is against Babylon to destroy it, because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple, because they destroyed his temple. Now who else destroyed his temple besides the ancient Babylonians? The Romans destroyed his temple too, right? So Babylon become, became the spiritual capital of the world. And it's Babylonian religion that kind of permeated the entire Middle East while, while Babylon ruled. And um, this had a, a great effect over even over the Jews and over every religion, the Babylonian um, set the pace in a lot of ways. And some of these religious rites that we see even in modern times are Babylonian. Like the Pope's hat. If you see his hat, that's, it's from Babylon. And, and a lot of the rituals that surround it are Babylonian. And a lot of the symbols they use, like the pine cone, is a common symbol in the Vatican. That was also a symbol in Babylon. And the handbag is a symbol. Um, all of these ancient Kabbalistic kind of mysterious symbols Babylon was right into that stuff, and so is the Vatican. They're right into that symbol symbolism. And it's Masonic and all that. You know, I don't know a whole lot about it. I really don't care. I just know what it is. This is um, what I see as the Babylon the Great, the get out of her, my people. Because God's people are in her. Um, many... You know, I don't hold things against Catholic people themselves because many of them are devout uh, worshipers of God. But they just don't get it that what Babylon really is. It's, it's not of God. It's, it's the cup in God's hand that has caused all the nations to be drunk. And... It is coming up for destruction itself. And God says, get out of her, my people. So 
the people who know God and who read his words and know him will know to get out. Those who don't get out, they will share in its destruction. So that's the message of Babylon the Great. And it's, it's, uh, it's a very important message. So the next verse we're going to take a look at is uh, Ezekiel chapter 23. Verse 1. The word of the Lord. Okay, first of all, who is Ezekiel? Now, um, Jeremiah was the prophet that was in Jerusalem when the Babylonians destroyed it. And Ezekiel, about 10 years before the destruction of Jerusalem, Babylon came and they set up a puppet king. They took the, one, the king of Jerusalem and set up his son or his brother as a puppet king. And they took a bunch of slaves with them and went back to Babylon. And Ezekiel was among those captives that what got taken with by Babylon about 10 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. So that's who Ezekiel was. And Ezekiel was with the captives leading up to and after the destruction of Jerusalem. And he's prophesying to the captives. But it's also for us. Okay? And the word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother, and they committed whoredoms in Egypt. They committed whoredoms in their youth. They committed adultery. There were their breasts pressed, and they were bruised, the teats of their virginity. And the names of them were Ahola, the elder, and Aho Aholiba, her sister. And they were mine. They were God's wives. And they bore sons and daughters, and thus were their names. Samaria is Ahola, and Jerusalem is Aholiba. Ah so he's talking here about the northern and the southern kingdom. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Jerusalem was the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. And Ahola, which would be Samaria, played the harlot when she was mine, and she doted on her lovers, on the Assyrians, her neighbors, which were clothed with blue, captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding upon horses. Thus she committed her whoredoms with them. Now what's this mean with the city of Samaria committing whoredoms with them? Is she is depending on them to save her. Uh, Samaria was at war with Judah and with, I can't remember, Samaria made like a coalition against Assyria and then Samaria depended on Syria, uh, on Assyria and, and, and paid her and adopted her religious beliefs and paid tribute to their king. So kind of turn, turn their back on depending on God. So that's what God's calling adultery. When his people worship a different God, that's adultery because his church is his woman. And he loves his woman and takes care of her. But if she goes after a different God, then that's like committing adultery. Therefore, O Aholiba, who is Jerusalem, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up your lovers against you, for whom your mind was alienated, I will bring them against you on every side. The Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Pekad, Skoa, Koa, and all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding on horses. I will do things, these things to you because you have gone whoring after the heathen. You have go gone whoring after the Gentiles and because you are polluted with their idols. 
See, so this is the whoring, the, the adultery and the pollution is the idols of the Babylonians. God never liked idols, never will like idols. You have walked in the way of your sister, therefore I will give her cup into your hand. So the ten lost tribes, her cup into your hand. Thus says the Lord God, you shall drink of your sister's cup deep and large, and you shall be laughed to scorn and had in derision. It contains much, the cup. You shall be filled with drunkenness and sorrow and with the cup of astonishment and desolation with the cup of your sister Samaria. You shall even drink it and suck it out and you shall break the sherds of it and pluck off your own breasts for I have spoken it, says the Lord God. So it's like really, really bad. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back, therefore bear you also your lewdness and your whoredoms. The Lord said moreover to me. Okay, we might as well look at this. Because this is going to list out their abominations. So we get an idea of the kind of things that they did. The Lord said moreover to me, Son of man, will you judge Ahola and Aholiba? And yea, declare to them their, their abominations. They have committed adultery, and blood is in their hands. With their idols they have committed adultery, and have also caused their sons who they bear to me to pass for them through the fire to devour them. Now that was uh, one of the idols they would sacrifice the babies to them. And um, this was very, very bad. Moreover, this they have done to me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day and profaned my Sabbath. Because they put idols in the temple. For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, and furthermore, that you sent for men to come from far, unto whom a messenger was sent, and lo, they came. For whom you did wash yourself, you painted your eyes, and decked yourself with ornaments. It's like the city had a... Had a a, a lot of they decorated the city and had a big party for these men and sat upon a stately bed and a table prefer, prepared before it whereupon you have set my incense and my oil so the incense and the oil that's meant for God they gave it to the idols And a voice of a multitude being at ease was with her, and with the men of common sort. So they, they, they not only, the other thing they did was that they joined the multitude, the, the, what most people think and what most people want. We'll do, you know, people aren't coming to church, so we'll do, we'll put on a concert. And that will bring them in. We'll, we'll do things that people like to make them come to church. So now you're taking on the moral standards of the multitude and forgetting about God's standards. And brought Sabians from the wilderness, which put bracelets on their hands and beautiful crowns on their heads. Then I said to her that was old in adulteries. So this is after she's been doing it for a while. Will they now commit whoredoms with her and she with them? So she's going to commit whoredoms with these ones too now? Yet they went in unto her as they go in unto a woman that plays the harlot. So they went in to Aloha 
into Ahola and unto, and unto Aholiba, the lewd women. So they invite in other religions, right? Um, what's that ecumenical movement? They're inviting in every other religion and not being separate as God has called out Christians to be separate from other religions that uh, it's a much higher standard and um, to, Christianity is meant to call people out of other religions not to bring other religions into Christianity and the righteous men they shall judge them after the manner of adulteresses and after the manner of women that shed blood because they are adulteresses and blood is in their hands so what's the shedding of blood well in medieval times there was a lot of blood shed today um, oh there's war too right Iraq was destroyed uh, Libya was destroyed um, Libya is a good example they said okay we're gonna make a coalition of the willing and Gaddafi is going to bomb his own people so we have to create a safe airspace in Libya so all these countries got together to destroy Gaddafi's air force so that he couldn't bomb the people of Libya and then what did they do they bombed the people of Libya they bombed the shit out of Libya so that's another shedding of blood and nobody says anything about it and nobody they just are all all gung-ho for the next war just because the news says it's a good thing it's like I haven't seen a just war in my lifetime except maybe the destruction of Isis so I don't know I, I don't know it's it, there's a lot of blood on a lot of hands for thus says the Lord God I will bring up a company upon them and I will give them to be removed and spoiled Samaria and Jerusalem and the company shall stone them with stones and dispatch them with their swords and they shall slay their sons and their da daughters and burn their houses with fire thus I will cause lewdness to cease out of the land that all women may be taught not to do after your lewdness so he's going to make an example out of Samaria and Jerusalem so that all the religions will be taught not to do what they did. And they will re recompense, and they shall recompense your lewdness upon you, and you shall bear the sins of your idols, and you shall know that I am the Lord God. So that's a huge um, message about Babylon the Great. It's, it's, it's huge. If you really try to... It was mainly geared towards the ancient city of Babylon and the ancient city of Samaria and, and Judah um, and Jerusalem at in 586 B.C. But it also gets transferred by the book of revelation up to today it 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 re, it's a recurring theme and samaria from all my studies samaria would be the uh, would represent the christians and judah would represent the jews or you could also look at it as Samaria represents Christians who worship idols. Like there's certain type, types of Christians. You got the Catholics, Anglicans, Eastern Orthodox, and uh, Coptics, and a few others that all have idols. And 
And I'm, I'm not just saying just statues. I'm talking about pictures as holy pictures and holy objects and like dead corpses as holy objects and any kind of, it's all idols. Any kind of object used as some powerful thing to connect with God is an idol. And um, so there's so there's those kinds of Christians, and then there's the Protestants who are against idols, but they still do some of the other stuff. Is they first of all they join in with this ecumenical deal, and second of all they join in with the world, and they join in with all these ideas that are not from God. And then the other thing about having like a well, let's have a concert and you go in there and it's like I don't see anything holy about it you know they're all waving going ooh, ooh and having a holy show but it's for them it's not for God you know it's it's about it's it's really it's just it's like a it just doesn't seem it just doesn't seem godly to me so I don't know, there's there's a lot of good churches too. I don't want to talk down against all of them. But um, like some of these mega churches, it's just not, it's about getting rich, right? Um, God will make you rich. That, that's not biblical. God will make you rich, but not. it's not about money. And it's not about power. It's not about Rolls Royces. It's just not the gospel. So that would be maybe like Jerusalem, who um, is the the more conservative type of Christian that is still not really Christian. And then there's real Christians, which are not included in that. So I don't know, there's a few different ways to interpret it. Now Habakkuk is not really known, there's not a lot known about Habakkuk, but from his prophecies, he prophesied about the coming destruction of Jerusalem. So he was probably... Um, Something like Jeremiah, one of the prophets uh, leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to read a little bit about Babylon from Habakkuk, just to get the, uh, the feel of Habakkuk. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O oh Lord, how long will I cry and you will not hear? Even cry to you of violence, and you will not save. Why did you show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. So why did you show me, God? You told me all these things are wrong, and now I see it all around me. Why? And now I'm praying about it. Why will you not stop it? Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment never goes forth. For the wicked compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceeds. Behold you among the heathen, the, uh, you among the Gentiles, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which you, you will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I will raise up the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians and the Assyrians, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Yeah, um, everyone was very afraid of the Babylonians and, and the Syrians. They used to uh, have, they would capture people and torture them outside the city gates 
of a city they were they had under siege and they would uh, rip out their entrails and do all kinds of crazy stuff um, they were very cruel and it's not like they were going to be nice to the city if they opened the doors they were just showing them what that was going to happen to them when they got in. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1 to 4 I will stand on my watch and set me on the tower and I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, and not lie. Though it waits, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not wait. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Okay, so that's what was coming. The just will live by faith. And that's... Uh, from the, the Apostle Paul pointed that out about Jesus Christ. Now we'll go take a look at verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe unto him that gives his neighbor drink, that puts the bottle to him and makes him drunk also, that you may look on their nakedness. Now that could be mean about looking on them when they're being stupid and acting like an idiot and laugh at them. You are filled with shame for glory. Drink you also and let your foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned to you and shameful spewing shall be on your glory. As now you're going to be a drunk and you're going to be an idiot. For the violence for the violence of Lebanon shall cover you and the spoil of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood for the violence of the land of the city and of all that dwell therein. What profits the graven image that the maker of it has made it, or gra grave has carved it, the molten image, and a teacher of lies that makes of his work trust therein, or that the maker of his work trusts in it, to make dumb idols. What good is it? This is about being drunk, okay? So there's a literally getting drunk and giving your neighbor a bottle. And then there's being drunk with idols and giving your neighbor an idol. Because it's like a, it's a spiritual drunkenness. Woe to him that says to the wood, awake, and to the dumb stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. So there's um, how God views idols. Any idol. It doesn't have to be uh, a statue with gold and silver on it. It can be anything. A string of beads, a, a little cross. You use any object like that to try to commute with God. God doesn't like it that way. He wants your heart and your mind. You have a heart and a mind. See, God doesn't need idols in any way. No, not even a little thing to use to connect with God. Because God gave you a heart and a mind. There's nothing greater than that. 
to commute with God. Your own heart and your own mind. You can do it anywhere, at any time. Even in, within your heart, you can, you can talk to God in any place without opening your mouth. But then in the privacy of your own home, you can open your mouth and you can praise God. And you can do it without any objects whatsoever. And that is the, the, the whole message about not using idols because it's a distraction. It distracts your focus away from God and gives the glory that belongs to God to an object. And that's the problem with idols. That's what's wrong with them. And then there's a lot of bad teachings associated with them as well. Because of um, demonic forces are associated with these idols. So those demonic forces are what brings in the bad teachings. And it may seem good, but it's not good. So now our next section, we're going to take a look at the New Testament and what the New Testament talks about these things, these cups and these idols and uh, the, the Babylon the Great. We'll take a, a, a quick overview of that in the New Testament. Okay, uh, so this is Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. And you'll find the same story in Mark chapter 10. If you want to look it up, but it's not much different than this one. Okay, then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. Now Zebedee's children, they were two of the apostles. I think, uh, um, I can't remember which two, but two of the apostles were brothers. And he said to her, what will you or what do you want? And she said to him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left hand, in the kingdom of God. To be the two chiefs beside him, right? But Jesus answered and said, You don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink and, and to be baptized with a baptized and are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said, We are able. And he said to them, You shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptized, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of by my Father. So it's not his decision, it's his Father's decision. Now they say, well, wasn't Jesus God? You have to understand the three states of Jesus. Uh, that Jesus was with God, and he gave that up to be born as a man, and as a man, he gave his entire life to God. And because of that, God exalted him, raised him from the dead, and exalted him back up to his former position with God. So when he's on the earth, walking on the earth as a man, he is a servant of God. But when he's in heaven, he is with God. So he's saying, this is not mine to give, because he has not yet been exalted back to glory, right? And when the ten heard it, the ten other apostles, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. But Jesus called to them and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, 
and they that are great exercise authority upon them. It's like the Gentiles have these, uh, these hierarchies of authority, you know, kings and princes. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever will be great among you, let him be your servant, your minister. And whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life for a ransom for many. So he's showing them the kingdom of God doesn't have these power hierarchies like men do. So... Uh, listen, churches. Okay, now. So that's the first thing when he's talking about his cup. Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink? Now, what cup is he talking about? Is he talking about being crucified? And he said also... You shall indeed drink of my cup. So what's he talking about? Well, we'll find out maybe in some other verses. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 11, verse 39. And you'll also find this same story in Matthew 23, verse 25. Okay. And the Lord said to him, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. You fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? And he's talking to the Pharisees and he's talking to them about, um, you know, they're asking, why do you eat with unwashed hands? And he said to them, he's criticizing them about, um, you washed the, the cups, but you washed the outside of the cup, but not the inside of the cup, because you want everything on the outside to look clean. But God wants the inside to be clean. He's saying, uh, you fools... But rather give alms of such things as you have, and behold, all things are clean to you. So he's saying, if you make the in, he's talking about the soul. He's saying, if you make the inside of the cup clean, then the outside is clean also. Let's take a look at Matthew 23 for the same teaching. Matthew twenty three twenty five, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You blind Pharisee, clean first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Same thing. Now, we have a similar thing in Mark chapter 7. Then came together unto him the Pharisees, and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. These were the Jewish teachers in Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, or that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, unless they wash their hands often, they don't eat, holding the tradition of the elders. Now, the tradition of the elders is what I was telling you about the Talmuds, the Babylonian and the Jewish Talmuds. That's the tradition of the elders. 
And when they come from the market, except they wash, they do not eat. And many other things there be which they receive to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brass vessels and tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do you walk not? Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but they eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered them and said, Well has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So it's like what they say, but not what they actually believe. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The Talmuds. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things you do. And he said to them, Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever curses his father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift to God, by whatever you might be profited by me. So, whatever I give to, a man says to his father and mother, whatever I give to you is a gift to God. And you suffer him no more to do anything for his father or mother. Because if everything he gives to them is a gift to God, then how can he honor his father and mother? Or how can he give his father and how can he give his father and mother anything? Making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and many other such like things you do in in the Talmud teaching. And when he called all the people to him, he said to them, Listen to me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from the outside of a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are what defiles him. If any man has ears, let him hear. And when he entered into the house from the people, so he was no longer around the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you so without understand uh, are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that wh- whatever thing from the outside enters into the man it can't defile him? Because it enters not into his heart, but into his belly, and it goes through his intestines and gets put out the other end, as with all food. That which comes out of the man, that defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adultery and fornication, murder theft, coveting, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, that's like uh, lust, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and defile the man. So there's the cleaning the inside of the cup makes the whole cup clean. And it's the heart that needs to be clean. And these are a good example. A lot of the Ten Commandments, plus some other things too, which uh, pride, foolishness, blasphemy, uh, lust, deceit, wickedness, lying, theft, murder, fornications. Now fornications, that could be talking about idolatry. Mixing, worshiping other gods, adultery, 
uh, all of this stuff, right? Okay, Matthew 26, 26. We're, we're going to look at the Last Supper here. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, the bread. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink, all, drink you all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink from here of this fruit of the vine until or from this day until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay. The same story you'll find in Mark chapter 14, 23. And we're going to read this one. Luke 22, 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Because it was on the Passover he died. And um, the night of the Passover when they eat a lamb. Uh, ever since it was commanded by Moses. Since the, the first Passover in the land of Egypt. For I say to you. I will not any more eat thereof. Of the Passover. Until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of, of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Okay, and then a few verses down, you'll see the same thing. Uh, likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrays me is with me on the table. So we're just gathering information here. Luke 22, verse 40. And when, when he was at the place, this is in the garden after the Last Supper. When he was at the place, he said to them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. And as he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So what cup? The cup that he just initiated at the Last Supper, the cup of his blood, which is shed for all men. And why are they drinking his blood? Is that the cup he's talking about? If you're willing, remove this cup from me. Not my will, but your will. And there appeared an angel to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So he's sweating blood. And when he rose up from the prayer and he was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he yet spoke, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. So, what, what is it about this cup? Take this cup from me. So he ha and and you you indeed will drink the cup that I drink. Let's look further. Okay, John chapter 18, verse 7. Okay, we'll start here. And Jesus said, Whom seek you? And they answered him, the, the soldiers, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, who betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said to them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. 
Then he asked them again, Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these others go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, Of them which you gave me I have lost none. So he didn't want any of the others to be killed. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and he hit the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And then Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. The cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? And then he healed the servant's ear, as is a well-known story. So, but here he's saying the cup. So, the cup, I, the cup, shall I not drink it? So he's going to drink the cup, and the cup is the crucifixion. Then, that his blood will be shed for all men for the remission of sins, and he will be tried and beaten and crucified. So that's the cup that he's praying that. Father, take this cup from me. Maybe he's praying, you know, let me just be the kingdom here on earth and I'll start right from here. But God the Father was like, nope, you're going to drink the cup. Because every, every kingdom on earth drinks the cup. Right? And so he drank the cup and now the cup gets passed on to the last, to Babylon. Now, is that in any way tied in with the cup of the Last Supper? No, I think they're two different cups. But that cup, that, that Babylon takes up that cup of the Last Supper, they take that cup and use it for their own power and for their own evil gain. Because they... Uh, they gained gold from all over the world. They, they, they ruled the kingdoms with that cup. And now, they're, now they have all the other religions of the world joining them as if they're the, as if they're the, chief, the chief dog of them all because of that cup. And they are the ones who will take him down those ones that he's bringing in to join in all these other religions, which God calls whoredoms or fornication, bringing all these other religions into God's religion, those are the ones who will take him down. Okay, now we're going to take a look at some of Paul's writings about the cup. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. Therefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. This is coming from Paul after the death of Jesus. Flee, flee from idols, all idols. I speak as to a wise man, judge what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. So this is what joins us together. Behold, Israel after the flesh. So that he, now he's talking about the Jews, right? Israel of the flesh. While Christians, he is calling Christians Israel of the spirit right? Israel of the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. So anything the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. Because they're sacrificing to Zeus and 
Aphrodite and Artemis and all these Roman and Greco-Roman myth mythical gods, right? And I would that not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we pr provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now we're learning there's a cup of devils that's, that's, that's associated with idols, right? That's the cup of devils. And there's the cup of the Lord, which is the cup of Jesus, which is associated with the Last Supper of Jesus. So there's the two cups right here, the cup of devils and the cup of Jesus. Now 1 Corinthians chapter 11 Verse 23, For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given it thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. So, so now the cup at the Last Supper represents the cup that Jesus drank on the cross is the death of the Lord. So you do show the Lord's death until he comes as, as often as you drink this cup of the Lord. And he said, should I not drink the cup that God has given me when he was on his way to the cross after the Last Supper? So that's his death. So the cup of the Last Supper is the same representation of the cup of his death. And is that not the cup of God's wrath? That Jesus was sacrificed for all of our sins. That he drank the cup of wrath though he had no sin. Do you start to see the connection now? Between these, the cup of wrath and this cup. But there's this cup is not the cup of devils. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So you see, there's two cups. So let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and that cup. The cup that was given for the Lord's blood for to remember the Lord's death. That's the cup we want to drink of. For he that eats and drinks unworthily unworthy of it, eats and drinks damnation. That's, it become, the same cup becomes the cup of wrath. He eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep or in death. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. So if we do not judge ourselves, then we will be judged by God. So um, it is the same cup. It's what's in your heart. See, if you have a clean heart, then everything on the outside of the cup is clean. So you have a clean heart and you drink of the cup of the Lord, then you're clean. But if you do not have a clean heart and you drink of the cup of the Lord, you drink to your own damnation. It's, it's the cup of God's wrath. And now, if you have an idol in your heart and you drink the cup of the Lord, then what are you drinking? So now we're going to jump up in the Revelations. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel 
to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, to everyone on the earth, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. Now, how do you do that? By reading His, his Bible, His words. Not by listening to anyone else who reads it. Read it yourself and understand what it's talking about. Fear God and give glory for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made the heavens and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. So him that created the heavens and the earth. Not evolution, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And the fountains of waters, that's the fountains of waters, the Noah's Ark. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So what is fornication? Fornication Spiritual fornication is mixing God's teachings with the teachings of idols. And so there's this she. She is talking about a church. Right? It's like, like God talked about Samaria and Jerusalem as two daughters. When God talks about she, he, he's referring to a religion or, or a church. She made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath, the wrath of God, of her fornication, her mixing God's teachings with idols. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So what is the beast and his image? It's, it's attached to uh, drinking the cup, which is like of the fornication, which is mixing all together the, the, all the religions of the world. The, the, um, the beast is and his image are attached to what's kind of come out of this ecumenical thing with the they'll be drinking the wine of the wrath of God now that's the cup that Jesus left the the golden cup that Jesus initiated becomes the ca the cup of wrath if drinking unworthily now, if you drink it unworthily, that means like you're worshiping idols and drinking this cup. Like, think of um, the king of Babylon, the last one that used God's cup to throw a party and the God's hand wrote on the wall, you are weighed in the balances and found wanting. It's the same thing. It's using God's cup in the wrong way. Right? Right? So the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. The, the, Jesus is the lamb. Okay. And the smoke ascends up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image. So that beast in his image is think is coming. Um, but it's got to do with image is an idol. Or this this beast and his image, it tends to be the image came to life. So we could be talking like a television. The image is alive. Or it could be talking about some AI thing coming where they'll have this image like an image of Mary that talks now and it's going to tell you what to do. And, you, and then people will start worshipping this thing. Like 
who knows how far this goes, you know. But here's some advice here. You take it for what it's worth. <clears throat> here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, the real God and the real Jesus, as written in the Bible. There's the key. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from here on. Yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So they will die for God because they won't take that cup. Okay, uh, let's check out Revelation chapter 16. Revelation 16 verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice of the, out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as, what, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three, Hearts, and the cities of the nations fell. So all the cities of the nations fall because of this great earthquake. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give to her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So this is when Shishak is going to drink the cup. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So there's a Shishak getting the cup, and kind of like it's going to be pretty intense time when that happens. Okay, Revelation verse 17. Now the Revelation, you must understand, is not... Um, in sequence up to the end. It kind of bounces back and forth, talking about before and after, before and after. So now this is, a, this is one of these cases where, um, where it does this. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying to me, Come here, I will show to you the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters. So what's the whore? The harlot is the church, the woman, who mixes the teachings with, of God with idols, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. So the kings of the earth have, mixed, have mixed the teachings of God's with idols with her, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk, confused with the wine of her mixing the teachings of God with idols. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. So now he's, he's saying, okay, here's the judgment on Shishak. This is why this judgment is happening. So now we're going back in time to see, it's like now the movie goes back in time to show us why all this came to be, right? So who is Shishak and what did she do? So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. Names of blasphemy. Oh, what are, what are some blasphemous names I can think of? Vicar of Christ. Holy Father. How about that one? How many Holy Fathers are there? When you're talking about the Bible, and Jesus called his Father the Holy Father, there's only one Holy Father. That's God himself. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. So she was dressed, the woman, the church. The woman is always a church. It's God's church, right? Representing God. 
was dressed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations. That means abominations are false gods and filthiness, false teachings of her fornication, mixing the teachings of God with the teachings of idols. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots and the abominations of the earth. So now this Babylon the Great, this mystery, Shishak, has daughters, right? She's not the only one. She has a bunch of daughters. She's the mother, the mother church. And there's a whole bunch of other churches that are in cahoots with her. And they all have little golden cups too. And they also have the abominations. That means the teachings of idols. Okay. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Okay. So uh, there was a lot of Christian wars. A lot of people died. In, in medieval Europe in those times and I imagine you think of things like Rwanda if you study take take a close look at Rwanda and see what that was about that was two tribes that that was the the ones who continued with their uh, African traditions and the Christians and there was one day on the radio where they were all given a single a signal and all the Christians turned around and slaughtered all the ones that wanted to keep the African traditions and that was the great genocide in Rwanda and if you look into it there are many many genocides and you might say well they were they were worshiping idols. Yeah, but they weren't claiming to worship God. They, the church is supposed to be saving them, not killing them. And the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her. Okay, we don't want to get into all this. This is a whole other video. So now we'll take a look at uh, Revelation 18. Now we'll go a long way with this one. Babylon is the same from ancient times until now. She's a corrupter of God's teachings. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils because of all the idols, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now why is it every? Because the ecumenical movement brings all of them into it all religion for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her every president goes there to see the pope every one of them and why do they all have to go there what's that got to do with the united states or canada too what's it got to do with our leaders that they all go there they, they do it for votes. But that corrupts our system, doesn't it? It sure does. All the kings of the earth committed fornications with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So who's in charge of the merchant uh, law of the sea? And the merchant shipping in the world? The United Nations? That's very, very tied in. 
I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. See, so the God's people are in there. That you do not, you're not part of her sins and you don't receive of her plagues because it's about to come down. And if you're in there, then you're going to get it. So he's calling his people out. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. That's like, like when Noah was floating on the sea with the ark, and God remembered Noah. And it's time for the water to recede. So now Babylon has made all the nations drink of the cup of God's wrath, and now God remembers Babylon. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double to her double according to her works. In the cup which she filled, fill to her double. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. Yeah, Holy Father glorified herself. And so much torment and sorrow give to her. For she says in her heart, I sit a queen, and I am no widow, and I will see no sorrow. It's like, this is going to go on forever for me. I'm, I'm doing great. I'm not doing anything bad. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day. So it's going to come fast. Death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, they are all in this together. They shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. This will be a real big crisis in the earth. And all the kings of the earth will be like, Oh no, what are we going to do now that she's burning? Standing afar off, because they don't want to be burnt with her. Saying, we didn't have anything to do with this politician. Alas, alas. Oh, such a bad thing, that great city, Babylon. That mighty city, for her judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth, the merchant shipping. They made billions and zillions and billions of dollars. Weep and mourn over her. For no man buys their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, thine wood, and all manner of vessels of ivory, wood, brass, iron, marble. It goes on and on, and at the end, and slaves and souls of men. Because what do they do? Well, they ship idols all over the world, right? Give everyone an idol. And, and the, the slave, slave trade, trade is uh, alive, alive and well. well. Shows, Shows that, that uh, this, this is, is also, also behind, behind the slave, slave trade. trade. Look at what's going, going on in America. America. With all, all these people, people coming in, in the, the border, border wide open. open and, and what are they saying? 20, 20 million, million people, people came in. And... and there's, there's a slave trade. There's sex trafficking and human trafficking. That's a slave trade. And these people who want this are a part of it. They're making money from it. And, and, and all of Europe is, is a part of it too. They're all in on it. Like all of these globalist powers. This is Babylon the Great, the globalist powers. So all the fruits that your soul lusted after are departed from you. All the things which were dainty and goodly are departed from you. You shall find them no more at all. Because you've been exposed. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand far off. We didn't have anything to do with that. For fear of her torment. Weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet 
and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches has come to nothing, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea stood afar off, we don't have anything to do with that. And they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like this great city? And they cast dust in their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea, by reason, by reason of her costliness. For, one hour, for in one hour she is made desolate, Rejoice over her, you heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. It's like now, you no longer have to be ashamed to call yourself a Christian, because people won't look at you and say, why do you worship idols? And why do you do this? And why do you do that? But they're always talking about all the things that they do, not about the things that you do. And a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, now this is, uh, what did Jesus say? Anyone who harms children, it would be better for him if a millstone were tied around his neck and he would cast into the sea. So there is another one, like, almost like a, a little symbol of pedophilia, maybe. A great, a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great city of Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harps and musicians and pipers, trumpets, shall be heard no more. No craftsmen, not shall be found any more. And in the light of candle shall shine no more in you. So there's the candles, the voice of the bridegroom and bride, weddings, and the merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorceries all nations were deceived. So who's the one giving sorceries, uh, rituals, and teachings of spiritual things that all the nations, every nation takes note of what they do when it comes to spiritual things. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So it's like, who's behind the wars? The, the endless wars. Who's behind this? I don't know. I'm only listening to what God says. I don't know. But it sure seems... It sure seems to be a, an industry these days, right? All these wars. So that concludes our video. Pretty intense stuff. Um, I hope that um, people get something out of this and that... Uh, whether you drink the cup or don't drink the cup, uh, maybe you will think of it a little bit differently. You know, it's up to each person. That each person was work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. And God is not something to be played with. So... I guess that's the message of this video. But at the same time, if you honor him and avoid idols, that's the, that was the number one warning of several apostles. Avoid idols at all costs. So any idol, anything that even seems like an idol, you don't need it. All you need is your heart and your mind and your mouth. And you praise God in the things that you do and in the things that you refuse to do. And you don't steal. You don't lie. I mean, if you find yourself telling a little fib even, you kind of maybe make up for it or, or 
pray about it, you know, and you take it seriously. And that is how you honor God. You, you do your best to be a follower of his teachings. So, I will see you next time. Goodbye. Don't forget to subscribe and like.